Welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today I have something very, very special for you guys. If you haven't already liked and subscribed to the channel, I would greatly appreciate you doing so. Uh, we're going to talk about very exciting news with regards to my highest conviction sector, which is the uranium sector. Uh, so I'm going to do a deep dive into that. We're going to give an update on the uranium ETF that we hold in the eToro portfolio. And I'm going to introduce you to my new Substack group. And for those of you uh, looking to join the group, the ROI Club, there is a, an option strategy there that I have entered. And I'm showing you exactly how I do it. Uh, prices to pay everything in terms of putting on the trade. That has a potential return of 2,100%. So I know you want to uh, stick around for that. In the meantime, if you are new to the channel, I'm a popular investor on eToro and uh, an investor. Uh, anything on this channel is my opinion and what I'm doing with my money or the money that I manage. I do put my money where my mouth is, but it's not advice, guys. It's just what I do. And so disclaimer, your capital is at risk. Please uh, choose financial advice that is personal to your situation. And don't blame someone on the internet if you uh, do something silly. Okay, take responsibility. Without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, quick overview on the macro. So as you will no doubt uh, already know, we're in an energy crisis in many places around the world, particularly Europe, even more so Eastern Europe. Russia this week has cut off uh, gas supply from Nord Stream, Nord Stream 1, and they've been playing lots of games, um, putting out uh, reasons such as maintenance and, and sanctions, not being able to get the parts and so on and so forth. There's a whole lot going on, but today, finally, they've cut off Nord Stream 1, and it looks like a bit of a standoff between the Russians and the uh, Western Europeans. Western Europeans are burning wood and coal ahead of the winter. Why is that? Because gas prices have gone to the moon uh, in terms of TTF uh, Dutch futures for the gas. Gas is so expensive right now that they are using as many alternatives as they can. Uh, not only is it unaffordium, it is unobtainium uh, with no more gas supplies uh, coming through. Uh, various places around Europe have got storage for the winter. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how all this plays out. Another key point, I just read uh, an email from Josh Young yesterday that I got uh, talking about the propensity of European manufacturing uh, to have to switch from gas to oil. Obviously, if you're using gas as a manufacturing input, which uh, many European um, uh, fabricators do, it's way too expensive now. So they have to shut down their businesses or businesses have to change in terms of their energy inputs. And so Josh is expecting... Uh, potentially uh, somewhere up to around 800,000 barrels a day worth of new oil demand uh, coming on to uh, global markets over the next year or so due purely and simply to this uh, switching from gas to oil um, to generate electricity for manufacturing uh, input, which is uh, a little scary. The focus has been on nuclear because finally people around the world are realizing that nuclear is the only solution we have to be able to generate a significant energy return on energy investment to provide base load uh, sustainable power to grids in civilization uh, without emitting uh, the co2 uh, so very very exciting we've had the germans and the californians uh, state that they have done a little bit of a backflip in terms of extending their nuclear power plants because they have no choice uh, they've had blackouts and brownouts in California, Germany, obviously are going back to the stone age in terms of creating uh, electricity and energy. And so uh, necessity has dictated they extend their power plants at least for the next three years, which of course keeps more unexpected demand on the market, taking more and more supply off the market when it comes to yellow cake and derivatives and uh, higher end enriched uranium. Japanese restarts, uh, that's been the big one this year where all of a sudden Japan has uh, done a U-turn, uh, pun intended. They are now, instead of just uh, reusing or, or selling old inventory, they, are, they have got that already sequestered and they will start to look to become buyers again in the term and spot market. Again, this simply adds more demand to an already tight supply. Nuclear, as we know, is uh, being considered by all to be the key future fuel source. Okay, this is what I was talking about when we come to get that out of the way. 
uh, gas prices in Europe, okay? So gas is not a global market. Uh, Americans have Henry Hub, Canadians have ACO, uh, TTF is the main one used in Europe. It's a Dutch uh, futures market for natural gas. So as you can see, uh, absolutely <laughs> incredible increases, 989% uh, increase to where we are today. It was over uh, a 10 bagger uh, just a, a week or so ago. So very, very uh, scary stuff when it comes to energy supply in Europe. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a visual as to what I was uh, mentioning earlier. Here I've taken different excerpts. So Germany plans to extend uh, the runtime of two nuclear power plants as their emergency reserve. Incredibly though, these clowns are still planning to uh, discontinue uh, nuclear power into the future. So if you, yeah, if you can explain that to me, um, yeah. Uh, I, ca I can't, I don't, know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what, uh, what will make these people change their mind, but they, they will either be booted out of power or they'll have to change course. So Vice Chancellor Habeck, Habeck insists Berlin will stick to plan to ultimately end atomic power. And that's because the Greens have just taken this position. They're opposed to nuclear energy and they've stressed that Germany won't reverse its decision long-term, uh, but in the, in the near term, they will. Okay, so I mean, sounds like a purely political uh, stunt to me, but I don't see how they will be able to power their grid and meet their climate net zero commitments without nuclear. I mean, it's just, uh, it's not mathematically possible. California lawmakers extend the life of the state's last nuclear plants. This is Diablo Canyon in California. This is a, yeah, this is quite a good move. I mean, California is an extremely rich state. Um, it would be something like the eighth or ninth largest economy in the world, just as a state. And so it takes special talent to be able to stuff it up. But the uh, governments there have been able to do it. Lawmakers approved legislation aimed at extending the life of the last operating nuclear power plant. And so they've only got one and they were scheduled to uh, mothball it. And now they've had to change course due to everything that's happened with it inability to provide uh, a basic necessity to modern civilization, which is electricity. Diablo Canyon, uh, state's largest single source of electricity has been slated to shut by 2025, but they're going to keep it open potentially five years longer, as well as getting a, a $1.4 billion forgivable loan in terms of being able to, to maintain and look for alternative sources of power as well. And I'm sure there are a few little uh, uh, bits of cream being taken off the top that will end up somewhere outside the energy sectors, shall we say. Diablo Canyon generated nearly 9% of the state's electricity market last year and roughly 15 percent of the state's clean energy production i mean you just can't take off nine percent of your energy production in a given year and not expect to have problems so uh, there are some the sources left down uh, below if you wish to read those articles uh, a misnomer if ever i've uh, heard one the inflation reduction act, reduction act it's hard to say with a straight face but we have to use the name that they give it it's just been signed into law, 30 billion worth of credits uh, for current operations. A lot of this information has been taken from uh, the latest quarterly report from Go Rosen, which you can uh, see in the source down below. Uh, I highly recommend you read it. According to Bloomberg, analysts believe this incentive could help uh, keep nearly 40% of the current US nuclear power uh, capacity operational going forwards. So huge. 700 billion has been provided for the support of HALU, so high assay, low enriched uranium production. You can't just take yellow cake out of the ground and throw it into reactor. It has to go through processing and, uh, and enrichment procedures. Most of the Gen 4 reactors use this HALU, and that is uranium that's been enriched to 17 to 20%. Okay, instead of the normal 5% for most other reactors. You, most of the enriched uranium comes from Russia, and that's why it's a, it's a real national security interest if we have geopolitical differences, shall we say, between the West and the East. Uh, the Western powers need to be uh, to stop uh, messing around and secure uh, sources of energy, um, both for uh, ongoing uh, consumption and production of power, but also to have uh, strategic reserves, not selling these things onto the market to buy votes. Instead, they need to be sequestering and, and and having a, a good solid uh, source of um, energy to be used in an emergency. 
public sentiment is changing. It's been palpable. You've been able to uh, see that over the last uh, one to two years. And uh, I think that we're starting to see things uh, change when you have the adoption of nuclear and natural gas being ratified into European law to say that it's a clean, green uh, source of energy. That's a big change and it's a big positive change because that is where most of the uh, emission reductions have actually come from. It has not been from renewables. It's been refining and improving sources that we already have. Ideal solution to our energy needs because it gives you that energy return on energy investment uh, the highest that we, we know, over 100 uh, units released for every one unit of input and produces zero carbon. So we know now we have the small modular reactors that really can't overheat, that don't cause any nuclear waste. It's, uh, it's hard to find a negative, really, uh, as a, uh, if you're a serious person looking at, at solutions. But it will take time to come online. Big, big news. This is the big one in terms of the uh, investment uh, or capital markets and point of view and that is that the spot price has been rising such to the point where the sprot physical uranium trust spot is almost at its premium uh to nav i believe it did tick over there for a short time what that means is with this physical uranium trust when the um when spot trades at a premium to its net asset value, so when the, the price is higher than the net value of all the uranium that it stores in its warehouse, they can issue more units. And when they issue more units, they get cash and they use that cash to buy more uranium. And so you can see how that becomes a, a self-reinforcing um, self or self-fulfilling um, philosophy when you've got this ability to uh, essentially float uh, more units, more shares, take that capital and buy more of the, uh, the stuff that underlines the value of your, your units. That is uh, a prime example of George Soros's theory of reflexivity. With a higher the price, the more capital available for reinvestment to, to increase demand and, and soak up the supply, which in turn increases the price. So I think we're going to see this reflexive loop play out uh, over the next few years. We've seen it happen. It's been up, it's been down, and it's steadily and secularly heading upwards and to the right. We see more term contracts being signed with utilities, uh, all in sustaining costs and escalating cost considerations uh, being taken into account in these contracts. So utilities having to play ball, realizing that these producers will have increased costs due to inflation, they need to be able to maintain their, their margins. And so you're seeing that uh, being reported at least as coming through with term contracts being signed as in the case of UR Energy, uh, which was last week, I believe. You can go in and read about that deal. Cost increases are squeezing producers' margins. In the case of Kazadamprom, we saw that starting to affect their operating margin. This is a common theme that I've spoken about across many different industries. The end result will mean a, a high uranium price or else these, um, these producers will, will slow their production. If they're not making any money, uh, they'll just have to wait or, or slow production at least until they get that high price. And so you've got these factors combined with spot driving up the spot price, combined with most of these long-term utility contracts rolling over over next year and the year after combined with institutional capital now being giving somewhat of a green light to say that this is an ESG friendly investment. It's such a small market that this, this flood of capital uh, could seriously blow it uh, out of the water. Lots and lots of catalysts there. All right, big news. I have uh, been given a commitment by uh, Scotty, aka Wen Moon. Uh, we've been having uh, a few discussions on Twitter and he has uh, agreed to come on to the channel for a bit of an interview. Any questions that you've got, leave me in the comments section. I'll see if I can get Scotty to answer those. And we're aiming for this coming Wednesday in September, um, but obviously we both got busy schedules. We'll keep you posted, uh, but would certainly be, uh, be great to be able to bounce a few ideas around with Scott. Here's a look at the uh, spot price of uranium. As you can see, it's been on an absolute mission over the last five years. And this is what happens. You have these long periods of consolidation and then zoom, it goes straight up parabolic. And then we get a bit of sideways chop, consolidation, and then boom. And as you can see here, we've had that reversion sideways chop uh, in this sort of descending wedge. And 
I think we're ready for another one of these uh, parabolic moves. Uh, Scott's the wizard with charts, so I'm sure he'll be able to share quite a few interesting ones with us. Look at the futures contracts uh, over a longer uh, time horizon. The, uh, the highest point at the tip of the last bull market, uranium uh, breached $140 a pound. And so I see absolutely no reason why we can't uh, at least revert back to that, if not go higher um, when it comes to inflation uh, adjustments that need to be considered. So I think the physical is the lowest hanging fruit in terms of ways of playing this particular sector. You could buy units in, in spot uh, or yellow cake, uh, which still trades, I believe, at a, a fairly healthy discount to NAV, uh, but that's on the London Stock Exchange. So you'd have to be able to, to do that. I own both. I own more spot, um, but for variety's sake, I, I do own some yellow cake because it's often cheaper. I don't, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a name and recognition thing. That's all it is, guys. They store the drums of yellow cake, I, I believe in the same warehouse in many instances. So getting access to the same stuff for a lot cheaper. So I do own some yellow cake. It's not as liquid as spot. Okay. And that's an exchange and a, uh, a question of a fame, I guess. Everyone knows uh, Sprott uh, unless people are familiar with yellow cake. Okay. The ETF, here's the ETF URA over the last year. If you haven't seen my old video uh, going over this particular ETF, you can watch that. Uh, our weekly high, we're down from where we are currently from the uh, yearly high, I should say, not weekly, about 23%. Okay, so uh, I think that we can easily uh, make that up and I'm continuing to add to the, the holdings in the portfolio uh, on these particular dips. If we zoom out and take a look at the bigger picture, this is really just sideways chart when you consider the ETF traded for over triple digits. Uh, during the last cycle, I think again, we will uh, be looking to test that over the next, who knows, maybe I'm thinking one to two years, um, but timing is always a, a fool's errand. Uh, I'm, very uh, I'm very satisfied and happy to sit in this particular investment. And as you know, it makes up uh, over 9% of the eToro portfolio. Okay. Let's have a look at the holdings. What is the ETF? What's in it? Uh, I've done this uh, in the past, but let's go over it again. Heavily weighted towards uh, friendly jurisdictions, let's say that. So as opposed to the Sprott URNM ETF, you have a little bit more uh, risk and juice on the table. This is a, a more of a vanilla ETF. When it comes to the options market, this is the better one to play because of the liquidity. Here we've got almost a quarter of the net assets are devoted to Cameco the number one producer in North America. And then we have Spot Physical. So you're getting a decent chunk of Spot simply by buying the ETF. You've got Kazatom Prom, okay, the world's uh, biggest, most important producer, uh, lowest cost producer as well, about 6%. Uh, but you do have that jurisdictional uh, risk and geopolitical risk with Kazakhstan being in a, a tricky situation with its uh, ties to Russia, but wanting to stay friendly with the, the West, etc. Pays out a wonderful dividend. Next gen is uh, my biggest holding in terms of a deposit or in terms of a, a mine that I think can be developed. Uh, I think it's one of the highest quality mines in North America. And so you get 5% exposure to that. Paladin Energy down in Namibia trades on the ASX. So this is a way that you can get access to an Aussie listed uh, company. Uh, UEC, and then you've got uh, lower exposure to some of these others. Denison is another one that I own an ungodly amount of options on. Um, I might actually start trimming them as we, we get into this next run-up. Yellow cake that I mentioned, so on and so forth. And as I can see, I wanted to show you the breakdown. Most of your investments here are in very friendly and safe jurisdictions. So over 75% in um, Canada, Australia, South Korea, and then you throw in the US as well you're going with the, the lowest hanging fruit and the, the safest plays, uh, at least traditionally, when it comes to jurisdictions. All right, uh, do you wanna leverage this beast? Okay, so if you like the theme, if you can see where we're going with uranium, if you wanted to take um, some of your capital and do what I'm doing in terms of putting that towards uh, something that can really give you uh, well, life-changing gains, I guess is the way to put it without trying to, be too hypey if you really want to move the needle uh, guys as mentioned i'm coming up uh, i've got a, a new Substack uh, private group it's called the roi club you can join that at the at the moment 
it is it's not expensive it's nine dollars ninety a month and uh, for now if you commit to a year subscription i think it's sixty dollars it works out to be about five dollars a month okay it's not expensive i'm going to put out the value for you guys and so uh, i really really want to i'm excited about that i really want to put out some high quality information um distilling all of this information that I get from various sources into a very cost-effective uh, membership where we can build a, a community. I pay, I think for Seeking Alpha, I think alone, I think I pay $45 a month, something like that uh, for the premium version. But Ticker, I pay the premium version. I pay, it's, it's well over $10,000. It might've been $20,000 a year for software and information. And so I want to distill the best of that and give it to you guys for a very low price. Simple as that. It's a members only platform. What you'll get is monthly in-depth analysis. Okay, so you get macro, you get a page of macro, you'll get a specific stock analysis. Okay, uh, with a very deep dive, both written and video content, similar to what I put out on YouTube, but um, really narrowed down to a specific uh, stock that I personally hold or am looking to buy with my calculations of their intrinsic value and their expected ROI. You'll get access to a master spreadsheet that I have where I have that information for about 30 different companies that I'm interested in buying or that I own already with their estimates of intrinsic value and expected ROI. So you'll be able to work out their cash flow yields and, and all that really good stuff. Okay. And the bonus that I've mentioned is uh, at least for this issue, you will get an option strategy with a potential 21x payoff. I will put out lots of bonus value, but eventually the options will be for another uh, really premium high ticket offering that I will organize later down the track. But signing up now, you'll get access to that strategy. And of course, um, sharing articles that I read throughout the month. So if you're interested in that, I'll leave the link in the description and by all means, uh, please sign up you will, I mean, you got a refund opportunity and all that stuff, guys. So if you don't like it, it's, it's no big deal. Um, monthly, $9.99. And then oh, you can cancel any time after that, or you can commit to 12 months and get a massive discount for what works out to be about $5 a month. Okay. So that's that. Disclaimer again, guys, uh, anything that you hear me say here on any social media, it's my opinion uh, and what I'm doing. It's not advice in any way, shape or form. And uh, just because I'm doing it doesn't mean you should, obviously, okay? It may not be right and it may not be right for you. It's just my opinion and what I'm doing. So I can't stress that enough. Before you take action on any of the things that you hear or see me say, you will need to uh, get personal financial advice uh, and take responsibility for your own decisions. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in uh, a value portfolio to copy on eToro, there's another link that you can click and you can add some funds and copy my moves. I'm on Twitter at the ROI channel. And if you do like this particular channel, feel free to like, uh, subscribe and share. I've got some great interviews coming up. I'll keep you in the loop and I hope to see you for those interviews 